by the summer of 1862. The war of the rebellion had not gone as the Lincoln administration had hoped for. In late June 1862, a new military unit sprang into existence in Northern Virginia. President Lincoln called on a career military man and an accomplished general from the Mississippi Valley, John Pope, to lead this new unit, the Army of Virginia. The Army of Virginia was supposed to change the conduct of the War of the Rebellion. Historians have long debated whether Pope's arrival in Virginia signaled the turn from a traditional war of army versus army towards a new type of warfare. A total war. An 1842 graduate of West Point, John Pope had started the war in Missouri. He was fully aware of the power of public opinion and the press. He made sure to publicly inflate his minor victories to gain national attention and the eyes of Lincoln, of course. In February of 1862, he assumed command of the Army of the Mississippi. Which, under his command, captured New Madrid in Missouri and Lila Number Ten on the Mississippi. He eventually served in General Henry Halleck's Grand Army before Corinth, Mississippi. It was in the summer that President Lincoln summoned him east to take command of the new Army of Virginia. Pope's arrival with the Army of Virginia signaled a change in the conduct of the war. In his General Order Number Seven. Issued on July 10, 1862, John Pope informed the residents in the region where his army operated that he would not tolerate any type of irregular warfare. About two weeks later, Pope followed his order with a much harsher General Order Number 11. The general demanded that his commanders arrest all disloyal male inhabitants within their lines and within their rear. The arrested individuals could only regain their freedom by swearing the oath of allegiance to the United States, which would also protect their property. Even more, those who dared return or those who broke their oath of allegiance faced stiff penalties. Pope's orders illustrated that the rebellious territory was an occupied territory, and the occupiers were not willing to face an enemy. On two fronts, especially if the second front involved terrorists indistinguishable from the local civilian population, these harsh orders, in conjunction with Pope's other instruction, signaled beyond any doubt that the lines between protected civilian property and military needs had started to blur. The goal was to simultaneously attack the rebel military forces and destroy civilian morale. After all, one has to ask: What does it say about a government that cannot defend its citizens? Pope was acting in accordance with a policy shift coming down from President Abraham Lincoln, as historian Daniel Sutherland has argued. 
in the course of the brief campaign and existence of Pope's Army of Virginia in the late summer of 1862, the United States implemented a primitive version of what would later be called total war. In his 1935 work, Der Totale Krieg, Erich Ludendorff suggested that total war places a much higher burden on the civilian population and added to the carnage of war with vastly more devastating technology. Total war impacted civilian populations and demanded a much higher degree of commitment on their part. We do have to ask, though, can a concept that emerged in the years between the devastation of the Great War and the Second World War be applied to a conflict in the 19th century? Ludendorff pointed out that his concept was not a new one and that the renowned military planner Karl von Clausewitz had already pointed to the politicization of war and its changing character. Clausewitz did not use the concept of a total war but instead called it absolute war. While in this concept warfare was still a military affair, Clausewitz acknowledged that military force would bring political changes. There was still an assumption though, that warfare was limited and didn't touch civilians. But at the same time, Clausewitz provides us with an idealized philosophy. And Pope was not implementing idealized philosophy when he was dealing with enemy activities around his forces, coming from civilians and uniformed individuals. Another aspect to consider, and often brought forward dismissing the activities of the Army of Virginia as part of a total war, is of weaponry use. For most of us, total war is associated with the carnage of the Great War, when a machine gun battalion could mow down large bodies of advancing enemy soldiers in no man's land, when heavy artillery and even early planes could rain ever larger shells over longer and longer distances, and when chemical warfare agents provided new killing mechanisms. Or we can look to the Second World War, where bomber squadrons could bring complete destruction to cities and industrial facilities. The devastation was horrendous. In contrast, Civil War soldiers could at best fire three rounds per minute. Infantry soldiers, that is. A slow pace of firing. Despite the new rifling technology, muskets remained a tool used at shorter distances, not employing the weapon to its full potential. There was no aerial combat, no devastation that we would associate with the Second World War. Some regions of the rebellious South did experience a high level of destruction. In some cases, destruction was accidental, as in the case of Charleston, South Carolina, which burned due to a likely industrial accident on December 11, 1861 or it was caused by evacuating rebel forces and government officials, as in the case of Richmond in April of 1865. Industrial regions in the past of the U.S. Army, as well as agricultural sections, suffered significant damage in an effort to bring the war to a speedier and successful conclusion for the United States. For residents around the Kennesaw Mountain battlefield could observe the devastation of battle and even brief occupation could bring. Regions like the Shenandoah Valley very much were hard hit as armies from the opposing sides occupied and reoccupied the region. The manpower requirements of the rebellion placed heavy burdens on the civilian population. Even more, many lands once under cultivation were abandoned for lack of a workforce. A substantial segment of the adult male population was engaged in either the military or military-rated efforts in the southern states. But again, was this a total war? It certainly doesn't meet our 20th century perspectives on total war.
As a result, a different term has been found useful: hard war, a term coined by the archetype of this type of warfare. William Tecumseh Sherman. In December 1864, he outlined to General Henry Halleck his accomplishments of the march to the sea. He wrote, "I attach more importance to these deep incisions into the enemy's country, because this war differs from European wars in this particular: we are not only fighting hostile armies, but a hostile people." And must make old and young, rich and poor, feel the hard hand of war. The arrival of his armies in the Georgia heartland put to rest what we may today call fake news: that the U.S. armies had suffered defeat and were on the withdrawal. This was not just about bringing physical destruction to shorten the war. This was about a deeply Psychological impact to destroy the morale and fighting spirit of the civilian population in the rebellious states. Ironically, Sherman recounted a few conversations in his letters, saying, "Many and many a person in Georgia asked me why we didn't go to South Carolina, and when I answered that we were en route for that state, the invariable reply was, 'Well.'" If you will make those people feel the utmost severity of war, we will pardon you for your desolation of Georgia. They never forgave or forgot in Georgia, and continue to remember the hard hand of war brought by Sherman. However, it is worth remembering that it was Pope in the Shenandoah Valley and around Culpeper. Who first instituted and tested this type of warfare? Total war. Thank you for watching this episode of the War of the Rebellion channel. If you liked the material covered, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell for new episodes. If there's a story of the War of the Rebellion you would like covered, please leave a comment. Use the comments to engage in conversations. Thank you for patronizing the War of the Rebellion channel.